morning, everybody. Just amazing uh, local talent. I mean, uh, I'm, very, I'm very impressed. First time I see that. And according to Nina, it's the first uh, uh, first time they they performed here. Right? Amazing. Congratulations. You know, the last uh, the last few days as I was watching um, uh, as you watch media, every time you open the TV, you see so many because of this uh, COVID-19. Uh, you were, I was looking at the images of uh, fashion shows being held in Italy without spectators. Then I was uh, uh, listening to the organizer of the uh, Olympics in Tokyo say they might consider holding it even without spectators. So I was imagining today that I would be speaking without uh, audiences. But uh, boy, this, uh, yeah, here there's uh, 1,200 of you. And uh, so it's quite, quite a Congratulations, it shows your uh, your commitment to the environment and the organizing prowess of Green Convergence. Titanina, congratulations. Thank you. Now, when I first began speaking about climate uh, issues, uh, climate change issues, following Typhoon Yolanda in 2013, a lot of it was about raising awareness within our companies in preparation for what would later be shifts in our company energy strategy. Now we later escalated our convictions uh, on, on this, such that by 2016, we publicly announced that we would have nothing to do with and would never touch coal-fired power plants. Now this was met by investors uh, and energy media with disbelief and shock, as if we were committing corporate suicide uh, on national television, and in the, especially in a highly competitive uh, power industry. But we kept on. In the yearly cover of our annual reports, uh, said it all, uh, especially at the parent company, the energy companies, it basically conveyed all of that. Now, my chairman's messages, as well as that of our presidents, uh, Ricky Tantoko and uh, Gary Spuno, sought to convey our feelings of urgency for action on the issue, and also the role that we intended to play in the transition to the decarbonized economy. Now, I remember always having to pull together the best studies, data, and also record shattering, uh, rec record shattering extreme weather events from all over the world just to make the point clear. Now, these last few months, I hardly had to do uh, any of this. As despite any of the climate change denials that are out there, they're still out there, the images on the nightly news speak so much louder of the changed planet that we all created. Now, as I was writing these remarks to you a few days ago, there was this quote that many have been using all of these years that kept playing over and over in my head. And that quote reads, We're the first generation to feel the sting of climate change and the last generation that can do something about it. Now, it kept telling me that the very generation alive today, and that's all of us here, in this room. We're actually presented with this opportunity that didn't exist a few years ago. As the signals from a climate change planet are already here, they're banging at our doors. But it's only a narrow window of opportunity and it's closing fast. Now, not too long ago, the stocks of electric utilities like Pacific Gas and Electric of California, or PG&E as they call it, these were considered widow and orphan uh, stocks, mainly because of their stability and regularity of dividends. Today, the yearly California droughts and wildfires have actually brought the mighty PG&E to its knees in bankruptcy. And I never thought I would see that in my lifetime. In Australia, the recent wildfires have directly and indirectly affected the lives of close to three-fourths of the entire 25 million population and scores of unique wildlife. 
3 million have lost their homes or property, and another 15 million indirectly felt the impact of blazes either from choking smoke or disrupted vacation travel plans. Australians now fear the onset of summers and a recurrence of the ordeal year after year. The worst drought in 100 years has struck Zambia and Zimbabwe, greatly affecting the mighty Zambezi River and Victoria Falls. The latter is actually called, it's named the uh, Mosi Owakunya, which uh, stands for the smoke that thunders. As you can see, it's powerful water mist from miles and miles away. Now, last December, I hear even up to today, that mighty falls has been reduced from year trickle. Now, I also mentioned to you at the Green Convergence uh, Kamayan Forum on Climate Change and Water last September that the Arctic and Antarctic have been heating up faster than anywhere else on Earth. The last five years have been their warmest on record. Well, that's not enough. Earlier this month, on February 7, another historic record temperature of 18.3 degrees Celsius was set for the Antarctic continent in the Argentinian research base of Esperanza on its northern tip. And it's alarming because it's happening barely five years after a 17.5 degrees Celsius record was set in March of 2015. But given how much potential sea level, sea level rise is trapped in the Antarctic, and the fact that we are a coastal dwelling and arch archipelagic nation, the warming Antarctic or the poles should actually worry us even here. For reference, here's a table that actually captures the major components of the cryosphere and how much potential they have to raise sea levels. Note Antarctica. Uh, Antarctica which can potentially raise sea levels by 58.3 meters. This is why it's called the ice locker of the world. Now note also that sea ice and ice shells are zero. That's because they already displace their volume in the sea. And like floating ice cubes in a glass of water, uh, they don't raise uh, levels when they melt. Um, but ice shells, however, despite the small sea level volumes inherent in them, they actually hold back uh, glaciers from sliding into the sea. And if they break or they cow, as they say, this paves the way for those glaciers and the ice sheets behind them to slide into the sea. And that raises sea levels. Now for other reference, I also included an informative diagram of the climate change feedback loops and the many complex interrelationships that affect the world of the cryosphere. Cryosphere is the world of ice, including the Himalayas. So it's both poles and the Himalayas. Now I won't discuss this diagram, this diagram in detail. Um, however, one worrying part of it I'd like to talk about relates to the boxes showing the melting of the permafrost. Now in the past, many thought of Arctic Siberia, Alaska, and Northern Canada <laughs> as unbroken deserts of ice and thin soils dotted with sage. The, the discovery of abundant fossils of mammals and other large grazing mammals now paints a different picture of what of once fertile grasslands rich with herbs and willows. The consequence is that Arctic permafrost is much richer in carbon and methane than scientists once believed. Now note that as a greenhouse gas, methane is about 28 times more potent than carbon dioxide. Globally, permafrost holds a gargantuan 1,600 gigatons of carbon methane. Now just for reference, 
the atmosphere currently contains about 850 gigatons. And the world emits about 40 gigatons per year. So the remaining budget, if we want to stay within the 1.5 degrees Celsius, is about 570 to 770 gigatons. And scientists now suspect that for every one degree Celsius of warming in the planet's average temperature, beyond the, beyond the pre-industrial level, the permafrost could release the equivalent of four to six years worth of coal, oil, and gas emissions that the world is emitting today. That's two to three times more than what they believed just a few years ago. And if we don't stop further warming, the effect of permafrost could be like adding the emissions of another China, which today emits about 13.2 gigatons per year. And this time you won't have a, go a government that can stop it because, you know, again, it's nature that's just doing that. Now, the upshot of all of this is that we may have to cut emissions eight years sooner than the latest UN IPCC special report suggests. This was the report that they issued in 2018. If we want to keep warming to just 1.5 degrees Celsius. Permafrost occupies an area twice the size of the entire United States. And we're only discovering now how fragile and destabilized the landscapes that surrounded it really are. Many of them, known to have melted only inches a year, are now subject to what they call abrupt thaws, as rapid as 10 feet in days or weeks. The threat of runaway warming is real, and most climate models today have not factored this in. There's an excellent cover article of National Geographic last September, and it tells this story really quite vividly. Disturbing. Now, these all have major implications for sea level rise. The UN IPCC projects in their fifth and latest report, but note that this was published in 2013 yet. Sea levels could rise a maximum of 3 feet 2 inches. That's the maximum they put in that report. Now, even just taking that report, as a point of reference, 100 meters. 100 million people today worldwide live within 3 feet of mean sea level. Note, however, that the report issued in 2013 did not yet take into account the massive melt occurrences in the entire surface of the ice sheets in Greenland the year before, and the various new findings on the fragility of the West Antarctic ice sheet, and now even the effect on permafrost. The IPCC is, not, is known to be ultra-conservative in its pronouncements and it systematically errs on the side of what they call less drama, as many have criticized them for. The fact that real world happen, uh, melt is happening much faster than the climate models have predicted shows how little is known of the cryosphere or how conservative to a fault scientists have become. NASA's James Hansen, who, if you don't know him, is, is one of the first and few scientists who's been boldly sounding the alarm bells of climate change since 1979, even before that. He published a paper in 2015 saying that we could see as much as nine feet of sea level rise by 2100. Now, just food for thought for, for everyone, because again, uh, the amount of water in the, in, the, in the planet has been fixed for the last four and a half billion years. And it's either in the form of ice or in the form of water. So as everyone knows, even a school child would know that. But food for thought is that 125,000 years ago during the last interglacial period, when temperatures were very similar to what we have today, which is roughly 1 to 2 degrees Celsius warmer than the pre-cluster levels, sea levels were actually 20 to 30 feet higher. And about 3 million years ago, 3.3 million years ago, 
when atmospheric carbon dioxide levels were like today's, sea level was 20 meters higher or 66 feet. So, as you can see, this is the kind of fire that we're actually playing with. Now, it's nice to think that, of course, technology will rise in time to save the world. We always do. We always think we have technology and we will catch up. And I guess things come to mind like renewable energy, electric vehicles, artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, maybe even 5G. But you know, we also know that technology has a dark side. And we're seeing algorithms that polarize nations, communities, and even families. And, um, and uh, you know, you're seeing even the rise of companies capable of manipulating them for political ends. I guess many of you have heard about Cambridge, this company called Cambridge Analytica, which has basically, uh, there's a whole Netflix uh, um, special on it, documentary that talks about this. And I was at a, a, a lecture maybe about a few months ago, Maria Reza was speaking about, about this. And one of the people, one of the whistleblowers from Cambridge Analytica, I'm trying to remember the, the, name, the name of the lady, I think it's a Jenner or Catherine something. And then there's another fellow named Chris Wiley. Both have come up with their own separate books talking about what Cambridge and Elder was doing. And they were basically manipulating a lot of uh, social media, which is why I think you should be very careful about social media. But they were manipulating it in order to manipulate politics all over the world. And one of the things Maria asked him in private, uh, Chris Wiley, was, um, do you know anything about the Philippines? Does it happen? And you know, the response that he gave was that um, your country is ground zero. We try things there first before we do it in the United Nations and the US and Europe. So Trump and Brexit were obviously uh, part of that. So again, be very careful you know, about the social media. But also, I guess you know, and yes, many of you know, that sometimes even the rise of wholesale bullying and even social comparison. Um, because everyone always puts uh, the best uh, pictures forward. And it actually deepens social isolation even as we remain electronically connected. So social media along with stress and opioid abuse are actually among the prime suspects in why suicide rates in the U.S. are at their highest since World War II. Populist politics is also on the rise, possibly a symptom of widening inequality gaps globally, where the rich has 10% controls 82% of the wealth. And in that 82%, one, the, the richest 1% controls 45% of the wealth. Economic development, as we've known it these past decades, have left too many behind. Climate change is also a poverty multiplier, and it's expected that inequality will widen as the poor find it even more difficult to avoid all the ravaging effects of the climate crisis. Also quite disturbing is that we're finding microplastics everywhere from the depths of the Mariana Trench to the peaks of the Himalayas. In fact, they're already in many parts of our food chain. Our own Pasig River, is the eighth most plastic polluting river in the world. And it's only 27 kilometers long. All the other top 10 rivers on that list are thousands of kilometers long. The latest COVID-19 crisis also appears to have what they say, what they call zoonotic roots. That's, it's actually born out of a spillover from animals to humans. So if you trace the practices back to this Wuhan food market where it began, you see a pattern of poor hygiene and the trade in exotic wildlife, like you know, bats, uh, bamboo, uh, horseshoe bats, bamboo rats, civets. Um, but you know, it's, it's trade in exotic wildlife for food, and much of it born not, not out of need, but from conspicuous 
consumption and we believe in spurious medicinal benefits. Now, the count isn't over, but in the first quarter of this year alone, the COVID-19 crisis has caused a precipitous fall in tourism and airline revenues, a plunge in auto sales, the first quarterly plunge in oil demand in the first in the last 10 years, a steep fall in Chinese GDP from its normal 6% down to 4.5%, the shutdown of Chinese factories of giants like Apple and Nissan, and the cancellation of many important trade, fashion, and sporting events around the world, just to name a few. It's likely this continues. Carbon emissions will fall or, sh or slow, show a slowing of its rise. Now, I don't think it's the solution that we've been hoping for. But what the COVID-19 crisis is telling us is that it is eminently possible to curb emissions if our lives depended on it. Now, it's ironic to think that the future of humanity is at stake with the climate crisis, but we must, still must upgrade to the latest iPhone or have that $40,000 per gift bag or shop seven times a week at a fast fashion store for clothes designed to be worn only ten times so you have to keep buying and buying. So the way the world works today is broken. And I would say it's severely broken. And much of what's broken with it is finally coming to roost. A combination of the mindless consumption economy and the unbridled capitalism, which prioritizes shareholder interests and the bottom line above, above all other stakeholders. It's this economic model of what they call take, make, and waste, or some others would call it the extract value, which you're just constantly extracting to the world. And this model is actually what's killing us. Now, someone used the analogy of a bacterial culture multiplying in a petri dish till all the nutrients are used up. What happens next, of course, is that all the microbes then die in a sea of their own waste. Now, of course, sustainability is now finally going mainstream. It's about time, and God bless everyone pursuing it genuinely and authentically. We're even seeing the rise of agencies and bodies willing to certify your greenness, sometimes for a measly, and I say this facetiously, a measly 20 million pesos. Certifications and external validation exercises actually have a role to play in all of this so that consumers and investors need not sort through all the data themselves, thereby facilitate, uh, facilitating buying and investing decisions. However, and I caution, it wasn't too long ago that some of these same bodies certified vast subprime loan portfolios as the credit-worthy instruments. And ultimately, these things triggered the financial crisis in the Great Recession of 2008. However, despite how happy I am to see sustainability gaining ground in the business world, as I was saying earlier, I welcome it cautiously, as it still stems from the old paradigm of quote-unquote extracting value from the world, from people and from planet. Albeit, in a less harmful way. Consumerism and the drive to incite spending way beyond our needs, as well as shareholder slash bottom line privacy before all else, still underpin the paradigm that's causing us to use up 1.7 Earths each year. And the US lifestyle, which everyone aspires to, uses up four Earths each year. So as you can see, sustainability alone no longer cuts it. In a world where all our planetary support systems, from our air, 
oceans, soils, forests, biodiversity, and our fresh water supplies. Which, because things like rivers, even uh, uh, glaciers, which are 90% of the world's glaciers are in retreat. And that has very, very big um, implications for water supply for hundreds of millions of people all over the world. But all of these planetary support systems are spiraling downward in decline. So as you can see, aiming for less harm is no longer enough. Now, I'll be even more provocative and ask this question. Could it be that the old paradigm, it's the old paradigm trying to extend its life and adapt to the times in an effort to change in order to remain the same? Now, when anyone talks about paradigm shifts, usually you think about slavery and how you know slavery was normal before, and today, you know, people look down and say, you know, this is a bad thing. But we have to remember that the paradigm shift over slavery, for example, though it was formally abolished by this 13th Amendment after the U.S. Civil War in 1865, it continued well past the mid-20th century for another hundred years through what were known as Jim Crow laws. Now, these Jim Crow laws were actually laws and practices that segregated and facilitated the arrest of free African American, uh, free uh, African Americans, and imposed unaffordable fines on them that forced them back into bondage. Grounds for arrest uh, of, uh, of Black Americans in rural Alabama in 1890 included petty things like gambling, changing employers without permission, false pretense, even quote unquote selling cotton after sunset. And the state of Alabama regularly arrested and leased such prisoners to the coal, lumber, steel, and brick making industries. The subhuman living conditions, the chains, and the torture continued as if slavery never ended. And up until 1951, these weren't occurring outside the law. These were occurring within the bounds of the law. Now, a lot of these are all very well documented in uh, Douglas Blackmon's Pulitzer, uh, Pulitzer Prize winning book entitled Slavery by Another Name. And in fact, I think you can watch it on YouTube. The, in entirety, what they've done a documentary on this. But even taking it to today, um, Michelle Alexander had, has a very powerful book, an important book, and I think it just printed uh, its 10th anniversary printing, uh, entitled The New Jim Crow. And it documents how racial caste in America never really ended, but has nearly been redesigned. There was a stat I was looking at which says that, um, you know, there's so much mass incar uh, incarceration that's going on in, in, in the U.S. And in Washington, Washington D.C. alone, three-fourths of black males are actually, in their lifetimes, get to taste prison. And almost all the poor black males, 100%, do. They get to taste prison in their lifetime. So I use that as just a way to, you know, just to increase the critical thinking for all of us. You know? Never underestimate the interests working to preserve old paradigms. Now Albert Einstein, Einstein liked to say this. We cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. This is why I really, really like the title of our summit this year that emphasizes the need for a paradigm shift that feeds nature. The climate crisis we face today is actually a golden opportunity for humanity to re-examine our way of thinking and begin rewriting the rules of our world worlds. But you all know that periods of great change are both challenging and dangerous 
immense upheaval that underpins any paradigm shift will always be greatly difficult and can even lead to despair in some. However, Jane Goodall, and I know a lot of you do know her, reminds us that it's knowing what can be done that gives people the will to fight. This is why it's high time that we rethink, reimagine, redesign, and rebuild our world works. It's a paradigm shift like the world has never seen before. How we get our energy, the design of our cities, buildings, and homes, the materials we use, what we eat, how we grow our food, how we handle our waste, how we use and recycle water, our transport systems and what powers them, ideas like regenerative agriculture, permaculture, the circular, circular economy, cradle to cradle, net positive buildings, the sharing economy, and we will also need to see inclusive business models that creatively deal with major social inequality and environmental problems. In short, everything must change. We are living through what will be history's greatest paradigm shift, and we no longer have a choice. I know that there's a lot to do, but each of us need to think about where our unique strengths are and apply those strengths creatively to strategic nodes where we can have the greatest impact on shifting the paradigm. For the energy companies under my wing, we're focused on the mission of quote unquote forging pathways to a decarbonized and regenerative world. We know there is no single silver bullet, but we are using our intimate knowledge of the power industry and where technology is headed to steer through the many hurdles, obstacles, and barriers that will surely be encountered along the way. The challenge before us is to keep your lights on even as we make the fastest transition to the decarbonized world. Now our spearhead is of course our geothermal energy platform uh, and that's company uh, EDC, uh, Energy Development Corp, which can deliver a kilowatt hour of electricity with only 0.0001 tons of CO2 emissions. That's about 9.5 or 10 times lower than a coal-fired power plant per kilowatt hour. Geothermal power is the only renewable energy source capable of delivering more than 24 7 basis continuously. Today, we're focused on utilizing technology and even digital technology to keep reducing our costs and drive up efficiency so we can fight head-to-head -head against our coal-fired competitors. Because sadly, you know, even today, even if we're clean, we go to customers, customers still require us that we match uh, coal prices, so we have to match coal head-to-head. -head. And it's a challenge that we're not shy away from. Now, we've also been active putting up other types of renewable energy plants like wind, we have the largest wind, um, wind plant in, in the country, up in Ilocos Norte. And we have, we're also putting up constantly in smaller scale, solar PV on rooftops. Now, although this has taken a while to take off, I believe cost reductions in solar technology are fast getting to the point where most, uh, more consumers are now ready to put them on their rooftops. And the economics makes sense. Now, we still see a lot of um, um, either uh, maybe just the ignorance of what the economics is like, you know, maybe a little bit of um, hesitance because of the initial costs. You know? So we're trying to again guide them and help them finance these things. But we're guiding them here so that they have a good experience and it encourages more take up from others. But we want to do this as fast as we can. But one aspect of the transition to, a more to more renewable energy is that solar and wind power are not always there. 
So when the wind's not blowing, or the sun's not shining at night, or even if there are clouds, the, the electricity uh, generation goes down from this. Now storage batteries like lithium ion um, could actually solve this. But although costs are dropping here too, today they're still considered expensive. And so far we're finding cost customers are still very sensitive to, to these costs. Now to encourage the public to use more of renewables, it is important that this intermittency problem is actually addressed seamlessly. This is why we're also developing pump storage hydro plants that actually like, act like huge batteries so that the grid can store energy from renewables when the sun is shining, when the wind is blowing, and other, and other sources, not for use later. Storage solutions like this have ushered in the world of renewable energy. But even then, it's still not enough. Uh, there's still not enough opportunities like this uh, that are around because they're very location specific, like where we can put up, um, so far we have one pump storage, uh, about 100 megawatts that we're developing in Magasi. It's hard to find uh, locations that are, uh, you know, that, that, can, that, that can do it. Now, as more and more renewables penetrate our power grids and our rooftops, and large-scale batteries that can solve the related intermittency problem aren't yet economically available, there will be a need for more power plants capable of fast ramp-up. This is important for our power grids to keep the lights on and actually a vital link that allows a higher penetration of more intermittent renewable energy in the transition. The best alternative for this large-scale job right now are natural gas-fired power plants. Now those in our fleet running on local Malampaya gas are capable of this and can deliver power cheaper with just one-third of the CO2 emissions and one-tenth of the other toxic emissions like NOx and SOx of a coal-fired power plant. Now when Malampaya runs out, imported LNG uh, or liquefied natural gas, if it's brought in today, um, is even cheaper than indigenous Malampaya, maybe about half the price. So this, is, so this is why we believe natural gas-fired power plants are key to the transition to the new ones. But having said that, they are still fossil fuel-based and greenhouse gas emitting. And thus, they actually should be phased down and run at progressively lower levels over time and purely just to complement renewables more and more renewables are put into the grid. And eventually, these natural gas plants, we have to phase them out. And notice I said phase them out, not sell them. Because when you sell the plants to somebody else, they'll be so incentivized to keep it running for decades and decades. No? So for me, it's really phase down and phase out. But you do this as soon as the renewables and batteries combinations become economically viable and more and more uh, people uh, take on renewables and install them on rooftops and, and, and it's, it's on the grids. Now, notice also, we're thinking about this, but a lot of these same natural gas plants that we have today, they can actually be powered by uh, much cleaner hydrogen. But hydrogen is still very expensive, but it's, it's getting there. And I know, that, I know that in the Tokyo Olympics, our partner Tokyo Gas was already going to put a lot of demo uh, uh, hydrogen uh, demo store, uh, depots and then running vehicles. So Toyota is coming out with a hydrogen running car for the Mirai and they were going to demo this one during the Olympics. Um, so it, it's there but it's still expensive uh, but it's, it's possible. But what we can actually do is this, uh, these power plants can actually be repowered for very little uh, modification and run on hydrogen if that, that's possible. Now, the electricity industry is actually complex and oftentimes very difficult to understand. Thus, we actually take great pains to guide our customers through the maze so that they can enjoy cheaper, cleaner power. 
We're also doing the theoretical, which is enabling them to use less power and to find pathways to more efficient use of electricity. Now, believe me, there is tremendous amount that can still be done here, especially when you know how much power you're consuming. Today, you only get the bill at the end of the month, but you don't know how much power you're consuming. If you have power on, uh, you have a, a time knowledge of data on a, on a day to day basis or even an hourly basis, there is so much you can do with that information. And uh, we have a customer, for example, uh, and I guess for, for the chat, the reasons I won't mention, but he had, a, he had a bill of about 60 million pesos of electricity which you see every, every month. And we were able to put sensors on their factory. And they found out oh, they had pumps that were going on in the middle of the night that didn't have to go on and stuff like that. Because of that, they were able to rectify all of these problems and they saved more than 10 million pesos a month in electricity costs. And you can see that this is so common. It's going on all over the, not only in the country, but all over the world. And if you have that data and information, it's very, very powerful to be able to bring down the electricity use. So I, I'd like to say that a kilowatt hour save is actually the cheapest and the cleanest power source there is. But you know, I have, I have to say also that sadly, traditional distribution utilities, especially you know, uh, even like, like Meralco, which again we used to run and control, we no longer do. Uh, we, we've sold down things to the Indonesian uh, groups. Um, many distribution utilities will only do this gradually, if they do so at all. Because otherwise it means lower sales and lower revenues. So we're doing this maybe in a way that, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's theoretical. The most power uh, producers will never do this. Now, this decarbonizing our energy system is one thing. But just as important is that we ensure resiliency and reliability of our power systems, consistent with the demands of a climate change and more extreme weather plan. Now we were front row witnesses to this fury during the land now. As you know, our power plants, the geothermal cloud power plant, the biggest one was in the area. And um, of course, not only that, but many of the other typhoons that came after. And we've since been redesigning facilities like our cooling towers for higher, we designed it now for 310 kph wind ratings. And we're also using LIDAR to map and identify where we must reinforce our facilities exposed to geohazards. Aside from this, we're also building distributed microgrids for off-grid communities so that they can enjoy the benefits of electricity um, that electricity brings under conditions more resilient than waiting for centralized power lines from their local homes. Now this brings me to my final point and probably the most difficult part of any paradigm shift, which is our own thinking. The dominant thinking behind our current paradigm has been with us for hundreds, if not thousands of years, since the dawn of agricultural society. It's a very human-centric way of thinking about the world. And it's that nature is something to be dominated, conquered, and extracted from for human betterment. The pattern of take, make, and waste are directly derived from this thinking, which by extension treat our oceans, rivers, and air as open sewers. We never measure what we take from nature or what it costs nature to produce, and how much waste we leave behind for her to attenuate. In, in industry parlance, they just, we just call them externalities. Now humans need to shift into recognizing that we are part of nature, and not apart from and above it. You know, sometimes people have to point out to me when, when I use the word watershed, they use watershed as a very human centric way of thinking about our forests. Because a watershed, basically, we call it a watershed because it, that's where we get water. 
But in fact, there's so many other things that come from that. You know? So we should actually be using the term life share because all life comes from there. Now, of course, related to all this is also how we measure success in the world. You know, things like revenue growth and net income growth, these are major, major parameters that the business world always looks at on, on, a, on a daily basis, on a monthly basis. High stock prices and also, of course, shareholder value. We, they also, in the world, people look at their personal and material wealth also as gauges of success. And of course, countries look at GDP growth. All the marketing and advertising that we're bombarded with every minute of every day is actually geared to raising these numbers for some company or another. Now we, we're convinced that we'll be happier, our lives will become more complete, we'll be more attractive, become more better husbands, wives, fathers, mothers, if we buy this product for that. We spend money eating more nutritionless calories than we need, and then spend more money for gym memberships to bring that excess weight down. In addition, when economies sputter, many leaders' first response is to fire up growth and consumption, effectively trying to consume our way out of a crisis. And that's the thinking behind stimulative fiscal and monetary policy that we learn in our Economics 101 classes. Now, all things being equal and presuming we don't do anything differently from today, if we wanted to stay within the IPCC's 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2100 and reduce emissions down to net zero by 2050, GDP needs to come down by 7% annually till then. Now, it used to be a much smaller amount if we had, let's say, began acting on climate change uh, in the 70s, but in the very, very first time it was brought up. In the, world. the first global conference in the world was in the 70s, and there was consensus on what to do. But I think it's just like the smoking, like what happened with smoking, all the corporate lobbies came to basically dilute and confuse the issue. And there's a whole book that's written about that, um, uh, which, which I mentioned at the beginning. And it's, it's called Losing Earth, not everyone to, to, to read that. But it documents exactly how the same lobbies for smoking and then later for, the, for big oil, they basically almost obfuscated the issue to the point where today, now we've got to go 7% down. Before, it was so easy to do it, we have done it in the 70s. Today, it's just too difficult. It's very difficult. Now, remember also that this 7% annual, annual, uh, annual reduction of GDP, that was only achieved in the years 1929 to 32 during the Great Depression, and then later on, the Spanish flu pandemic, 1918, roughly also that 7% reduction. Contraction. No political leader would ever cause a depression or a pandemic deliberately. Now, as uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, the former president of the European Commission, liked to say, we all know what to do. What we don't know is how to win the next election afterward. <laughs> but needless to say, certain extent we can't really wait for our leaders and it's really our thinking that has to collectively change away from mindless consumption and the pursuit of bottom line growth at all costs simultaneously with an ability to decouple carbon emissions from GDP growth and even our definition our very definition of general prosperity we even have to decouple that from GDP Now oh, this is why I know I am setting a higher bar for a group of companies when I say we will forge pathways to decarbonize and regenerative work. 
I didn't use the word sustainable word. I used to generate delivery. We can no longer measure our success purely by bottom line growth and shareholder value. My own measure of success will be judged by how well we can aid the decoupling of GDP growth from carbon emissions. And on top of that, I believe it must be the role of businesses like ours to go beyond sustainability and into discovering creative new ways to improve and regener regenerate everything we touch, from our customers to our co-creators, co-creators are employees, suppliers, contractors, etc. The earth, communities, and our shareholders or investors. Every decision we make must consider the betterment of all stakeholders in that order. It no longer works the other way around when you consider shareholders the priority. Because then there's nothing left for the earth, nothing left for uh, the community. Now I say this, but I know also that this is not easy. And <laughs> again, another book, and you can tell that I stay up a lot of nights, really. <laughs> but uh, there's a book called The Enlightened Capitalist, uh, Capitalists by James Sotou that talks about the, a lot of the dilemmas of capitalists that try to do good, no? and many of them are actually taken out of the game. And uh, even someone like, uh, a recent example of uh, someone like Paul Coleman, who was the head of Unilever for the longest time, and he was the head of the World Business Council on Sustainable Development. He was also very uh, passionate about sustainability and all his sustainable plans. You know that towards the, before he, he left Unilever, he had to end off and fight off uh, a takeover attempt from a bigger company, a big company like Kraft, which basically was trying to say that if you let go of sustainability, we can, if we let go of sustainability, we can do a better job than you to get higher stock prices. So he was able to fight it off, but you know, it, it, it's stuck. And it's something like that that a lot of enlightened capitalists have to fight off. It's not an easy battle, especially because every day, every quarter, you have analysts that break how well your stock prices do. But I believe that enlightened shareholders in due time, enlightened shareholders, will also realize that there are no jobs, profits, or even remnants of shareholder value on a dead planet. I, I, I've uh, blown up this picture, this cartoon, and I've kept it right outside our boardroom so that even our directors see it every time we have a board meeting. So that they remind, I remind them where our priorities are. Now companies need to remember that we work amongst unique and nested systems from our stakeholders to communities, ecosystems, and nations, with each having a reciprocal role to play in the development of each one's potential. Like every organism in an ecosystem, we need to find the regenerative role that are, we are meant to play in a world that needs to be healed and strengthened. Now these thoughts, they actually make me feel very small and humble. Because now, everything that we've been doing so far just feels like a tiny first step on a long thousand mile journey. A journey that maybe I may never be able to finish and complete because it will never be finished. And no matter where we each are in this continuum today, I know that we're all going to end up doing it together. We cannot succeed otherwise. Now we're all imperfect beings with imperfect abilities in an imperfect, maybe broken world, but it never means losing the courage to make things better. And as the songwriter and poet Leonard Cohen wrote, and I quote, Ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack in everything. And that's how the light gets in. Now, 
paradigm shifts of this scale and magnitude can never be easy, especially in the early days as we strive to gather momentum. But remember that every caterpillar harbors dormant, imaginal cells, each waiting with the potential to transform into something else. As cells morph, the immune system of the caterpillar attacks them as if they're enemies. But as the transformation persists and the number of imaginal cells multiply beyond the critical tipping point, the body stops fighting them, changes over, and begins the process of nourishing those same cells instead. An unformed nascent wing may start out with just 50 cells, but grow to as much as 50,000 when fully formed. So the anguished and labored metamorphosis of a butterfly that can take to the sky in flight only begins the moment it's willing to give up being a caterpillar. Now let me end my remarks. Now let me end my remarks to you this morning with an old uh, Sufi story, the Muslim Sufis, eh? about, and this is about two young, it's originally about two young and mischievous boys conspiring to trick a wise old man. But let me alter the story a bit for the times. So, this morning I've made it a story about two prominent world leaders wishing to test the maturity and wisdom of a young 16-year-old girl. Now let's call her Greta uh, for the moment. <laughs> now with a live bird, bird in hand, the two adults conspire with one another and they say they will ask her if she knows whether it's alive or dead. If she says it's dead, they would simply open their palm and let the bird fly. If she instead says it's alive, they crush the bird and give her a lifeless corpse, proving her wrong either way. So with light bird in hand, they accost her and ask her mockingly, Young girl, hidden in my hand is a bird. Since you have great wisdom and like to tell us adults what to do, can you tell us if it's alive or dead? And the wise teenage girl then looks them in the eyes and with a gentle smile replies, the answer is in your hands. It's in our hands. Thank you.